So today we're going to be talking about threat modeling. How many of you are developers? Okay, excellent. And how many of you, have you heard about threat modeling before? Have you heard that term? Okay. How many of you are doing threat modeling now in your organizations? Okay, two or three of you. I hope that after today, after this presentation, it, it's going to be more. More of you are going to start to do this and start to put it in, into practice and, and think about it. Uh, because I think it's a really critical and crucial thing to do in security, in software development, in software development life cycles, is to introduce threat modeling. So as, I, as was mentioned, just a quick intro, uh, in addition to what was already mentioned, I'm a software security architect, uh, Microsoft MVP. Uh, I'm also a co-host with Chris Romeo on the Application Security Podcast. Anybody have heard of that or, or listened to it before? Okay, well, a couple of you, I recommend it to you. If you're interested in trying to get some security information to developers and other people who are new to security, uh, that's really the focus of our podcast, as well as just helping people understand about a lot of application security topics. Uh, we've covered a lot of stuff in OWASP over the last year. Uh, we have two seasons that are out there now. They're on iTunes and uh, Android and so on. Uh, but anyway, it's at appsecpodcast.org. Uh, you know, invite you to check it out. So let's talk a little bit about software design. Um, you know, one of the things when you're building software that you have to think about is requirements, right? You have to think about what are, what are the things that we need to do and what does this need to solve? We also think about the features, you know, some of the, the different things that uh, we need to make available and, and how do we implement some of those requirements. And ideally, one of our goals should be, I hope, build software that people will use. It doesn't make any sense to build something that people just discard or, or don't use because it's too difficult or it doesn't help them do their jobs, right? So we're, we're thinking about those kinds of things when we're building software. When we're thinking about secure software design, guess what? We're thinking about very similar things. We're thinking about the secure requirements. What do we need to do and what do we need to put in place that is fundamentally important for security? And we think about the features that go along with that. For example, uh, a login page of some sort. Uh, we think about access control. We think about um, some logging and other kinds of things that need to be put in place in our application in order to make sure it's secure. But also, <laughs> we think about how do we build software that people will use? Because, you know, at the end of the day, if we have something that people are not using because, well, for example, if it's too secure, if it's too locked down, and they can't use it, it, it just, you know, it's too much friction and those kinds of things, um, it certainly can be a challenge uh, as well for software. So you have to think about those kinds of things, that usability versus security. That's always in mind as well. But the other thing you're thinking about with secure software design is anticipating misuse. So not just how people will use your software, but how could they potentially misuse your software? How could they attack it? How could they do things that we never thought about before? Or that normally when you're building software, you're thinking about uh, how people use this in the right way, but not always thinking about how can somebody break it? How can somebody do something wrong and different and then find a vulnerability and find uh, some way to get into the system to compromise it? So we have to think about those things as well. And how do you do that? Well, I think that's really where a security mindset of some sort uh, can come into play. How many of you, I ask about developers, how many of you are in security today, working in security operations and, and things like that? Okay, excellent. And so one of the things I find for uh, security people, certainly once you start thinking about security, uh, you see the world differently. You ever notice that? You know, you see things one way, and then once you learn about security and start thinking about how things can break, uh, you think things differently. And in particular, uh, Bruce Schneer, who is well known to some, who was a you know, cryptographer, he's written quite a few books. On his blog, he wrote back in 2012 something about teaching others about this security mindset. And in particular, he pointed to an example where uh, there was a class at this Naval Academy where there were two professors teaching this, this course on cybersecurity. And it was a bunch of people that were somewhat new to it all. And what they said were, was, I think towards the beginning of the class, 
when it had started. They said, we're going to have a test tomorrow. You didn't know anything about it, but we're going to have a test tomorrow. But by the way, I want everybody to pass. And what they said was, we would like you to come in and write pi, you know, that number 3.14159265 and on the way on, to 100 decimal places. But I want you all to pass. <laughs> I, you know, it's a pop quiz or pop test. You don't know about it, but I want you to pass. And I want you to pass in any way that you can. In other words, I want you to cheat. I want you to think of ways creatively that you can get an A on this test. And so the next day they had the test and absolutely everyone passed. But the ways they came up with was really interesting. And in the paper it talks about how some, or one put on a tile came in the night before and wrote pi on the tile. And so they looked up and wrote it out. Somebody else brought a plate with a donut. And uh, you know, you pick up the donut and there was pie written <laughs> around and around on the, on the plate. Somebody else brought a book that happened to belong to one of the, the teachers. He, he wrote the book. And uh, they brought that in and said, hey, look, I brought your book. But on the back jacket was written out pie. <laughs> so you wouldn't ever have known that, oh, I, I got it here. And all kinds of creative ways they, they came up with to, to try to figure out how to pass this test outside of the normal way of maybe studying it and taking the time and try to write it out. And so, again, that was the, the, the premise, was try to think about some other way to do this, a way to circumvent the system in order to get in, in order to understand a potential attack. And so the quote from this that uh, Bruchner pointed out was this one from the paper, teach yourself and your students to cheat. We've always been taught to color inside the lines, stick to the rules, and never ever cheat, right? Because in seek, but in seeking cybersecurity, we must drop that mindset. So in order to have a security mindset, in order to think about how to build systems that people will misuse, potentially, we need to think differently. We need to look at the systems that we build in a slightly different way, in ways that you know, maybe somebody else might consider something different here. And can I anticipate that and then build something accordingly to counter that? So that's, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, this is from a, a tweet that uh, Miko Hypenin has been retweeting these things from back in 2012. It's kind of a future tweet type of thing. And I saw this one recently where it mentions, you know, it's just not fair when the attackers cheat. They really should be regulated to attack our defenses only the way we want them to attack. Anybody ever felt that? <laughs> Why aren't they just keeping to the rules? But they don't, you right? Did, right? What's that? You did, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My guess is no. I think what he's basically trying to point out, a point, is that uh, no, they don't. Obviously, they don't uh, follow the rules. They're never going to follow the rules. And so we as... Uh, defenders, we as builders, we as even attackers, we have to think about ways differently than what we normally do and build this kind of security mindset in order to build systems that are resilient to attack or at least deal with them appropriately uh, when they happen. And to me, that's where threat modeling comes in, where I'm starting to think differently about my system in order to think about what could go wrong what can I do to fix it? You know, what can I do to mitigate these issues and plan accordingly? And so really threat modeling is helping you think strategically about your software design or your secure software design. It's really a way of thinking to me. It, it's looking again at your system differently. It's also a, a tool, but it's not an automated security tool. There are some tools out there to help you with this, but there are no tools that I can set up to say, okay, uh, go connect to my system, push a button, and say, create a threat model for me. That doesn't happen. Instead, you have to think about your system. You have to think about the possible attacks. You have to think about what are the defenses that I need to put in place to deal with those kinds of attacks that could happen. And so, a as a, um, a definition, you know, it's really a process of understanding your system and the potential threats against your system but also the mitigations as, as a result of those threats that you've identified. Uh, as a friend of mine likes to say, it's critical thinking about security. A typical threat model includes these 
elements, an understanding of your system, however that is defined. Uh, you may draw a, a diagram of something, uh, a data flow diagram, swim lanes, whatever. Anything that helps you understand better what it is you're building or what it is that you're trying to think about. Uh, identify some threats, and there are many, many different ways to do that we'll talk about today. And then also try to propose some mitigations. What are some things that I can do in order to solve these problems, in order to address these problems that I've now found in my system or potential in my system? And then priorities by risk. Uh, it's all about risk. You know, a lot of things we might find, the threats we might find, we say we have a hundred of these things, but am I going to fix all of them at one time? No. Which ones are more critical? Which ones are the most important things that I need to address immediately and then get priorities based on that? So that's where you know, that risk can help you do that and figure out you know, where are the things, where are the places that we're at most risk if this was uh, realized, this threat was realized. So quick definitions. Asset really is just something we're trying to protect, right? Uh, an agent is just an attacker uh, basically trying to do harm to your, to your system. And by the way, they all look like that. You know, just in case you're not sure, they all dress like that with a cowl and a hat and all that stuff. Threat is anything that's going to exploit a vulnerability intentionally or accidentally. Uh, the interesting thing about the accidental, it, it, it can be accidental, right? I remember a reading recently where there was a, I think it was a fire extinguisher that took down Azure in Europe. And then earlier this year, there was a, um, a misconfigured server that took down AWS, Amazon Web Services across most of you know, Eastern North America. I'm like, wow, that was accidental, but it became a threat uh, based on some things that happened. And so sometimes these things can happen where, you know, mostly it's intentional, but then also accidents could happen that can, can be a threat as well. A vulnerability essentially is a flaw in the system that helps make the threat realized. Now, the two are not the same. Some people will use them interchangeably, but to me, a threat and a vulnerability, uh, you have to have one to have the other. Uh, the vulnerability, if it's not present, it's not really necessarily a threat anymore. And vice versa, if the vulner vulnerability is present, then the threat could be realized. For example, uh, a vulnerability, a typical one maybe is SQL injection. What is SQL injection? Well, that's the ability to be able, to, for, let's say from a website, to be able to go connect all the way back to the database and make changes and get data and all those kinds of things. What's the threat there? The threat is that somebody could do that. They can actually go to your database, make changes, get data. If I'm able to mitigate the vulnerability, in other words, use parameterized queries, um, you know, monitor that sort of thing, then I minimize the threat of somebody being able to get in that way to, to do harm to your database or change your database and things like that. So those two work together, but they're not the same. The vulnerability helps the threat be realized. And so when we're talking about threat modeling, typically we're trying to think about the threats that somebody could go into our database. We're not focused as much on the vulnerabilities. Uh, there's a lot of work done on vulnerability analysis. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about from the bigger design architecture, system design, what are the, the big picture threats that could happen within our system? Not the easiest thing to do, but that's what we're talking about primarily in threat modeling. And then risk is that potential for loss, damage or destruction as a result of that threat. Um, what do you think, the mouse has a chance here, maybe? <laughs> An attack is just motivated and sufficiently skilled threat agents taking advantage of that vulnerability. And interestingly enough, there's motivations that vary, right? It could be a hacktivist, it could be a script kitty, it could be a nation state attacker. And the skills can vary as well. You know, there are places where, uh, I don't know if you've heard about this, but in Ukraine and Russia and places like that where they say uh, certain uh, attackers or, or companies practically that are set up that have eight hour schedules just like us. <laughs> They come in, they do their attacks, they build tools, and then they go home. And so they've noticed in terms of patterns of seeing the IP addresses that attack, they have eight hour shifts just like us. They have project managers, they have release cycles, all the same stuff, which is really interesting. But that can vary, again, all the types of people that are out there that are attackers. And so a very interesting uh, dynamic there going on. But again, it's all about somebody taking advantage of those vulnerabilities. And this is a, a vocabulary just to see how everything relates to each other, the threats, the attacks, 
uh, the risk, the probability, and all those kinds of things. And my slides are going to be available, so you're, you're welcome to take a look at this and use it as well and, and, and check this out. So when do you make this a priority? Or make, when do you make it or do this? It really should be the, the first thing you do when you're building a system, this do threat modeling. It, it comes to me uh, as, as part of design and early on in your system. So uh, what I say is let threat modeling uncover your new requirements. We talked about that at the very beginning. You know, what are the security requirements of my system? Well, threat modeling and thinking about the secure design of your system can help you determine what the requirements are that you have maybe missed. Uh, ideally, that's where it comes into play, but really, in reality, what I see is that it often comes in after. You know, for example, I get called after a project's already been done, and they say, well, now we got it out there, we have some issues, can we do a threat model? Sure. But you'll find that if you're doing that after everything is done, uh, you can potentially have missed some things. So just be aware of that. Uh, if you're doing an agile methodology, uh, you can certainly make it a part of your sprint planning. So when you're doing your planning, you can think about user stories. You can also think about attacker stories. You can think about, you know, what's my threat model here? Or how is this impacted by this particular issue? What's the misuse of that? Uh, you can also set aside uh, what I call periodic security sprints. So especially if you have a, uh, a, a, a lot of stories, a lot of activity going on, you can set aside a time where, okay, let's take a step back and let's now think about the threat model of our system or this particular product or this particular service or, or whatever. So you can do that as well. So there are different ways that you can integrate it in. If you're doing DevOps, I've had people come to me and say, well, we can't do threat modeling in DevOps, you know, we're moving too fast. And true, you are moving fast, but somewhere, someplace, you did some kind of design. You did think about what you were doing somewhere. And so I always say still, even if you're not doing a, a full-blown threat modeling session, you could still be thinking about this stuff. And I think it's still worthy of, of you know, having training for these kinds of things to, to think about this and have that mindset so that as you go through and you're building out some stuff, in that design part of this, you're still thinking about these things. And so that's how you can integrate it there as well into your design. Uh, some very simple ways to get started, really. Uh, you can use a whiteboard just to draw a diagram of some sort. Uh, you know, you can record it using Visio or some other tool. You can use Word or Excel or some kind of spreadsheet or something just to record some of this stuff about you, that you're finding. I, I like this particular uh, example from Dennis Cruz. He, he put this out on, on this uh, site out here that he has a front and back, and I've done this when I've done workshops. I'll hand this out, uh, where you can draw your data flow diagram, you can record some threats and other kinds of things. And on the back, he has the vocabulary, he has the, the elements, so you, you know, you're familiar with stride, he has that there as well. So it's just a way to, very simple, to help people understand the concepts and be able to use them in their own teams. Another thing I've done when I've done workshops and worked with clients is to put together this worksheet where basically we're just in a small room and, and we're talking with a team and we're diagramming what they're doing and asking good questions and then we just start recording this stuff. So the threats and the countermeasures and, the, and ID associated with that and what I like to say is you know, turn that ID into something that maybe relates back to a JIRA or, or some actionable item thing that you're tracking, bug tracking or whatever is a great way to, as you, as you do this process, is not just to think about this stuff, but how do we then turn it into actionable items? I find a threat, I determine a countermeasure, and then I determine what do I do next? How do I follow up and make sure that I connect the dots and, and complete the circle, if you will, that I not just found the threats, but now I know how to address it, and I'm tracking it and keep track of it. Uh, there are some tools out there, as I mentioned. Uh, again, no tool is going to be available yet, <laughs> if ever, that uh, necessarily that lets you point to a system and say, build me a threat model. I've heard of some uh, potential tools of taking intelligence data, threat intelligence data, and feeding it back into a tool to help you verify threats, but really all of them still, you need to think of the system and build out something first. And so there's the threat modeling tool from Microsoft. That's probably the most well-known, it's free. Uh, there's also a 2017 version available to look at for a little while. 
Uh, Threat Modeler, Iris Risk are a couple of pay tools. They're both web-based tools, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, this OWASP Threat Dragon is, is one of the newest ones. It's an OWASP product. Um, it's an open source tool that's out there on the OWASP site. And it's web-based as well. Um, it's still a work in progress, but it's, it's a really cool tool. And I've shown it in a few places. And uh, you know, recommend if you want to look at something that's uh, interesting, you can take a look at that, uh, download it and use it, or use it on the web. There are a couple of options, uh, desktop or web. Uh, so there are some tools out there that you can use as well. So to get started with threat modeling, typically I'm, when I'm working with a team, I want to make sure we have a good uh, foundation. And one of the things I, I like to uh, recommend is this particular paper to get started is avoiding the top 10 security design flaws. Uh, everybody heard of the OWASP top 10, right? Yep. Well, in a same or similar vein, this is a top 10 of something. In this case, it's design flaws because as, essentially that's what we're doing with threat modeling is we're thinking about design flaws. And in this one, uh, this paper, it really helps you think about the difference between a bug, which is an implementation level software problem, and a flaw, which is a deeper level problem. It's a design decision that you've made. That maybe is a mistake. For example, I see quite often when I'm working with teams uh, that they're still using maybe SHA-1 or MD5 or something like that for their password uh, hashing. And you know, pen test is not gonna find that. And a lot of other automated tools are not gonna find that that's what you're still using. But if I ask the right question, and say, you know, what are you using for this method of, of hashing a password? And they say, well, it's MD5. It worked 10 years ago, it still works. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, but that may not be the best thing right now, especially with data breaches and things like that. And a lot of rainbow tables with MD5 hashes out there and all kinds of potential issues. So that's a design decision. That was something that was uh, a mistake that was made way back when. Now, you didn't know at the time it was good, but now you need to update it. And so those are kinds of things that you can find as you, as you work through this paper and also work through threat modeling and ask good questions. So this is essentially the process. And if you're familiar with Adam Shostak's book, I don't know if anybody have heard that or seen that, I did a book on threat modeling while he was at Microsoft. And, and his four things were, you know, what are you building? What could go wrong? What are you going to do about it? And did we do a good job? Mine are very similar uh, in terms of my four steps. Draw your picture, so it helps you understand the system you're building. Identify those threats through answers to questions, so some good questions and different tools for that. Uh, determine your mitigations and your risks. And then finally, very much, I think probably one of the most important things is that follow through. So don't just do the exercise, but figure out how can you come back and tie all this together and into some actionable items. So to start with, Drawing your picture. How many of you have seen something like this before? All right, what is it? Do you have an idea? No, it isn't. Actually, it's not a data flow diagram. It's something else. What, what is this? What kind of application is it, first of all? Do you have an idea? It's a web app. It's a web app, exactly. It's what's called usually a three-tier architecture type of thing, right? You've got, a, you've got a browser. You've got a web server doing something. You've got a database server. OK, great. I've got three things going on here. What can I know from this about the security of the system? There's no firewall. <laughs> no firewall. Very good. <laughs> Not necessarily, yeah, because it says HTTP and, uh, uh, well, on the browser of the web server is HTTP or HTTPS. It's got HTTPS, we're good, right? Maybe. Uh, but yeah, between the web server and, and the database server is TCP, IP. I mean, yeah. You, Ultimately, you don't know a lot. <laughs> you only know a few things, but I don't know what's happening internally to the web server. I don't know how things are communicating with each other. I don't know what's going on in terms of authentication and access control and all those kinds of things inside the web server. I really don't know. And so if a team gives you this or this is their drawing, it's not enough to be able to know what's going on with the security of the system. And so an alternative, and there are many, many ways to do this, but one alternative is to draw what's called a data flow diagram, which helps you understand how data is moving between the components in the system, which then also can help you understand how are we securing that data as it moves through the system. 
And so that's kind of the purpose of this. And so in this case, an external entity could be a user, could be a browser. A process or multi-process represents uh, different actions that might happen in your system. It could be components, it could be other kinds of things. The multi-process really just means here's something, but there's more things going on. It's more or less a black box of things. And if I want to drill in a little further, I'll, I'll see more things as we break that out, break it out and understand it better. Data store a couple lines, could be a, a database, could be a file. Uh, data flow is just some straight line with an arrow connecting something to something else. And then there's this idea of a trust boundary or attack surface as it's also called at times. And basically what that means, it's, it's represented by this dashed line to indicate that on one side uh, there may be no trust and then on the other side there's trust. And so if you think about it, for example, let's say a third party library or third party service that you don't own, maybe there's a trust boundary of some sort. There's, there's an issue about I don't trust this so therefore I need to uh, in order to get over there, I need to access it in some way, authenticate and so on. And even within your system, there may be places where uh, the level of trust changes. And so the idea being is that there are some places where the trust needs to change in order to, to move through the system. And so how do you represent that? In terms of an attack surface, it also helps you to think about where am I most vulnerable in my system, where outside I need to authenticate to get inside, perhaps. So that's what, another way to help you think about these things. So to start off, you know, we're talking about and thinking about the logical and component architecture of the system. We understand the communication flows. And so when you start drawing this stuff, essentially you're just saying, okay, let's start off with, this is what I call a level zero. Uh, and it's, it's similar to the other thing we saw, the other drawing, but in this case, now I've identified some users so let's say a user and an admin. I have a trust boundary of sorts. I have a server. But if you notice, I, I still don't know a lot about it. So I need to drill in a little further. And so maybe I'll go to what I call a level one, where now I've broken this out a little bit more. I have a couple of users. I have the web app itself. I have some data files. I have some audit data. I have credentials. I have a couple of services, the authentication service and audit service. I have uh, this management tool and so on. And then I'll start enumerating these things. You know, how do these things work together? What kind of data is being sent around? Uh, what does it represent? And by doing that, I'm starting to understand a little bit more about the potential threats that are going to come into play. Where do I need to put in some kind of access control? Where do I need to put in some authentication of some sort? And where does logging fit in all this too? So I started to think about that. And then I might identify the boundaries. I might identify where am I most vulnerable? Where are my potential attack surfaces? And then after that, I also may uh, you know, just essentially enumerate these things, number them, and so on, just to keep track of it. And there's some tools, like I said, that can also help you with that as well. So again, this first part is understanding your system. Understand what's the makeup of it. Now, this is not a whole lot different than maybe an architecture design, and you've probably done that before, where you built out some things. The one key difference about this one, though, than just a straight architecture design is that we want to use whatever we build, whatever we draw, whatever we put out there. The ultimate goal is not just to understand you know, business rules or flow, but really understand how can this help us understand the security issues within our system. So that's the goal. Let us figure out the security issues. And so, again, the first part is diagramming and understanding uh, the flows in your system. Now, identifying threats, most important part, but also most difficult part. And many ways to do this. Uh, one is to use attack trees. And uh, Bruce Schneer, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as a name, uh, wrote an um, interesting paper back in uh, 1999. It's still available out there on the web if you look for it. It's, um, a paper on attack trees where he introduced the idea of a kind of a workflow, a decision tree. Of, in this case, it was to get to a bank safe. How do I open a bank safe? Well, let's see, you can be a part of the, the team that puts in the safe, and then you know something about it. Uh, you can take the bank manager out for drinks and schmooze him, and maybe he'll tell you the combination to the safe. You know, all kinds of interesting, funny ways of, of trying to get to the safe and what's really probable and possible and, and, and ridiculous, but it's just a way of thinking through systematically from point one to two to three all the way to your goal 
And it's a, it's a way, again, of just thinking about building an attack pattern and an attack tree to get to your goal. Not the easiest way to build out a threat model, but it is a, it is a way. Another is just to think about you know, possible threats, potential threats in my system, what I'm using. CAPEC is one, OWASP top 10 can at least lead you to some possible things that might happen in your web application, for example. Checklist can help you as well to think about some things that might happen, or at least to, to give you an idea of where to go. Um, ASVS from OWASP and the proactive controls, both of these can help you think about what should I have in my system and then work your way back. And you can also use use cases and misuse cases. So a use case, as a user, I want to be able to log in the system. As a user, I should not be able to log in as a regular admin, or as an admin, rather. As a regular user, I should not be able to log in as an admin. And certainly not be able to go to certain privileged places in my application as an admin if I'm just a regular user. So those kinds of things as misuse cases. This is what misuse cases help you with. No one would ever do that. You ever heard that before? Yeah, no one would ever do that. And why would they ever do that, right? So that's when you're, you're thinking about this stuff. I, I, I like those questions because, you know, let's talk about this. Well, no one would ever do that, really? Well, let's explore that for a moment. Most famous way to think about uh, threat modeling, this came from Microsoft. Originally, it was the Stride framework, or um, essentially it's a mnemonic that represents uh, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. So spoofing is just simply pretending to be somebody else. Uh, tampering is, of course, modifying data that you know, shouldn't be modifiable. And then repudiation is you know, that claim of doing something and how do you prove that they did it. Information disclosure is, of course, exposing information. Denial of service is, is really you know, just not making sure the system is not available. And then elevation of privilege, of course, is just uh, being able to do more things than you sh should be able to do. And really, when we're talking about those things, we're just helping people to understand the opposite of those things that they really want. So to deal with spoofing, you need authentication. For tampering, you need integrity. You know, being able to verify data. Non-repudiation solves repudiation. And what does that mean? Okay, just the opposite. Well, it basically means logging and auditing or accountability, essentially. Information disclosure is, is solved by confidentiality and making sure that, you know, data that should be private and confidential stays that way. And availability helps deal with denial of service. And then authorization helps with your elevation of privilege. Now, if you've been around security for a little while, you probably recognize these things on the right. The CIA, the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability. The two A's, the authentication and authorization. And then the non-repudiation, some people call it auditing or accountability is another A. So that's what we're talking about when we say stride, is really helping people understand the threats against these things. And these things on the right, the mitigations that we need to put in place in order to deal with those issues as we find them. I also like to ask a lot of questions, functional questions, things that Stride may or may not address. For example, configuration management is one that comes up quite often. Deployment issues. Uh, I remember working with a team on a threat, doing a threat model and I asked them about some of their deployment. And in terms of configuration management, they said, well, you know, in our in development environment, in our staging server environment, the passwords and all that stuff in the config files are all encrypted and we do all the right stuff. But then someone said, in production, we have, um, I think it was Puppet or something like that that was pushing out these files, and they said, nothing's encrypted. <laughs> so in production, nothing's encrypted. And when they said that, and then you had these developers and architects say, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> we didn't know that. And so that's where a threat model, just talking about this stuff and how is system set up and configuration management and deployment can really uncover some things. Also, you know, session management, uh, auditing and logging. I like to always ask about logging, you know, what's being put out there for logging? Any privacy data that potentially uh, is exposed in your log files and things like that. And so those are always good questions as well that you may think, well, the, of course we take care of all this stuff. But as you work through this and talk with the team and, and, and ask the right questions, you may find some things that you may not even realize. Um, 
you know, other questions you can ask, you know, who's interested in this application and the data, the actors, the, the goals or the assets that you need to protect, um, you know, what kind of attack methods they might use, and then also any attack surfaces that we, maybe were exposed we didn't know about. Other questions, you know, data in the open, you know, are we encrypting everything properly, those kinds of things. Uh, one of the best questions to ask, is there anything that keeps you up at night? Uh, and I like this question because ultimately what you'll find is that somebody will know something. It's a button that nobody, I hope nobody will ever touch. It's a test button, it's a test ID that we have in there that you know, I hope nobody ever uses that one. Uh, I remember again working with a team where they said to me that you know, we've got a web, servicing, web service testing tool that's actually out in production. We use it to test our services internally to make sure they're running. <laughs> And we send different commands to it to make sure it's running. But it's not public. Nobody will ever find it. <laughs> but it's there. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I think you might want to look at that and really reconsider having this available on the public facing site. I don't care if you don't have a link to it. It's there. And, and so that was something they, somebody said, yeah, that's what we worry about. Somebody's going to go find it and do all kinds of interesting things. And so that's a good question to ask, to find out, you know, where are some pain points that people know about, but they're not going to tell you necessarily until you ask this question. Uh, one example is this confused deputy problem. And I see this quite often in, in, in microservices these days, where you have a lot of services that are doing things, and potentially you have some that are lined up that the further and further you go in, they have certain... Um, privileges, uh, privilege operations. And so A calls B, calls C, calls D. And so then the question becomes, well, if B calls C, what's to prevent somebody else calling B and C instead of A? And making B do something with C that maybe you shouldn't be doing. What are you doing to protect all of that? And so the idea behind this confused deputy problem, um, how many of you recognize this guy? Yeah. You remember him, how he would sometimes let somebody uh, trick him into getting out of jail and him into the jail cell, <laughs> you know, things like that. So the idea being is that here's a privileged operation, but tricked into doing it when he shouldn't be simply because it's not protected, it's not open, it's not checking. And so, you know, that's solved by capabilities or claims, uh, certain kinds of access control. But it's a problem, and a potential problem where I have all these things lined up and certainly have privileged operations, but I'm not checking who the caller is and what they can actually do or tell me to do because I just assume everybody trusts everybody else. And so that's the confused deputy problem. And you can find that as you ask about these questions in a threat model. So go back to our configuration management, just a scenario. Uh, in this case, I've got the web application. Where do you think configuration typically would just reside in a, in a situation like this? Yeah, for config, <coughs> configuring the web server, where do you think it normally resides? On the web server. On the web server, but where specifically? Uh, How about data files? So config files. So on the web server, correct, and in data files usually. And uh, those files, interestingly enough, now we, we're really good about thinking about, oh, don't trust user input, right? Don't trust all this stuff. But the reality is all of its input, data files are input, databases are input. I mean, you can, you can put a XSS vulnerability or XSS script, and if somebody's not watching it, you can store that all the way into the database and then read it back into your web page, right? And if you're not watching for it, you can actually store a, a a script that can compromise your site, pull it back and run it, and, and now you've got XSS. So it's all input, it's all input. And the same thing with data files, like configuration files. So in terms of a threat model for this, we think about, okay, first of all, what are we doing? We have a web application that uses configuration files. What are some security principles? Well, we want to be reluctant to trust, and we're going to assume secrets are not safe. So some questions I might ask. How does this app use those configuration files? Is there any kind of implied trust that the password is OK, the different locations that maybe I have services that I'm connecting to, external services I'm connecting to, and other kinds of things? 
am I assuming that all of those are okay? Is there an implied trust to it? And looking ahead, I might think about, well, what are some things I can deal with that in terms of a control or a mitigation? Maybe I want to set permissions on those files. If somebody changes that file, I want to know it. You know, it potentially somebody could change it. And then also maybe validate data input from those files. Use a fuzz testing tool, for example, to start putting other kinds of data into that configuration file and see how the system reacts to it. If it can't connect to a database correctly or if it tries to go to a different service than it should and things like that. So those are some interesting things in terms of a threat model for this to say, you know, could something happen? Is this a possibility? So again, we've identified threats through answers to questions, <laughs> stride, um, asking you know, different uh, things that could happen, scenarios, and so forth, to try to identify the threats. As a result of that, you're gonna come up with some mitigations. You're gonna come up with some, some possible solutions to those problems that you find. Now there are some options that you can address or typically use. One is just leave it as is. You find the problem, but it works. It's, it's not something we're gonna change, we'll leave it. Another is just remove it from the product. Uh, you determine there's a, there's a broken thing. I remember there was a, a car company in Europe that had a very similar to the Jeep Cherokee hack that happened a little bit later. There was another car company that said, hey, you know, people can get into the internet into the car and do things. And so what they did, they just turned it all off. They said, you know, we're not going to deal with it right now. We're turning that feature off. It's gone. We're not even, you know, forget it. It's, we, we didn't think it through completely. We're just going to turn it off. And so you can remove it from the product. You can remedy with technology countermeasures, which is ideal. You know, if you find that you have an authentication problem, put authentication in. If you have an access problem, access control problem, put that in, you know, and so on. The other one, of course, is warn user, which I call pass the buck. <laughs> you know, take the liability off yourself and give it to somebody else. You know, put up a warning. You go into a coffee shop and it has free Wi-Fi. Well, what they will say is, you know, it's on you. <laughs> if you decide to connect to our Wi-Fi, be aware somebody else might be able to sniff that connection and, and get insensitive data. But we're not going to set up the secured Wi-Fi at the moment. It's on you, so warn the user. So those are different ways that you can uh, deal with these things. The, at the same time, you might also think about the risk of these things that you find. So different ways to do this, you can apply some risk management. For example, the FAIR approach, which is a very um, intensive a quantitative way of determining risk. And I see that a lot in banks and other places are starting to use FAIR. It's been around a few years. There's a CVSS, which is a scoring system that you can use to determine based on vulnerabilities, what are the, what are the potential uh, scores of those in terms of you know, how likely could those happen. Another is this generic risk rating, which you'll see a lot of tools do that. They just basically, however you determine what these are, high, medium, or low, uh, you assign it that way. In order to do that, of course, is essentially um, high, medium, low based on ease of exploitation and business impact. So ease of exploitation, how easy is it to do this? If it's really, really easy, it's a high. If it's, you've got to use some tools and have some insider knowledge, if you will, that's a low. The business impact, if it affects a lot of users and, and tarnishes our reputation, that's probably a high as far as business impact or on the opposite side, it doesn't really affect a lot of people and so on, maybe it's a low. You put those together and you come up with some kind of rating. In this case, here's a CSRF issue. We'll, we'll give it a medium risk in this case. And we're talking about some of the description. We're talking about some of the countermeasures to deal with it and components affected. And so essentially this becomes a threat model of this particular part of the system. Going back to our configuration management to finish out on the risk of that, if I look at my data files and try to determine, okay, now I know some of the risks, or rather I know some of the threats and I know some of the countermeasures I want to put in place, what's my risk of these things? Well, if we own the box, maybe it's not so high. Maybe we do have control over it. In terms of somebody being able to change it, maybe it's a medium or low. But if it's somewhere else and I don't have control over it, maybe it's hosted on a cloud, maybe it's hosted somewhere else that, you know, I just, I push it out, somebody else manages it, maybe the risk is higher. And maybe I do need to put in those controls on who, who changes the file and those kinds of things so that I know and can manage that. 
So that's a complete threat model right there, where we have determined our system, we determine the threats, we determine some mitigations, we determine some risks, and then after that, some kind of a follow through. And that's essentially the next thing is this idea of follow through. Documenting what you found and decisions you made, filing bugs or new requirements, and then following up on that. Did we fix everything? You know, is this no longer a viable threat? Is, has it been mitigated? And then if you missed anything, review it again. Now, when do you think threat modeling is done? When are you done with threat modeling? It's ongoing. It's something you're going to continue to do. Now, the reality is when you're going through a session like this, you can't just go in, you know, forever and ever. You have to say at some point, okay, it's good enough. But it is something you should revisit. It is something that you continue to update. It's not something that's a one-time exercise. You say, okay, now I've got a threat model. Let's go on. But it is something you want to continue to revisit. If you have new features, if you add you know, new requirements, you want to do a threat model again or at least revisit it. Now, the first time you do this, if you've never done it, it will take a little while. You know, and what I like to say is that uh, a good strategy is just to have maybe a couple of hours at a time, go through your system, document some things, and then come back again. And maybe break up your system into various parts, maybe by service or by, um, you know, different things that are going on. And then as you get going through this, you'll get faster, you'll get better at it, your mindset will change, as we talked about at the beginning. That, that idea of threat modeling being a mindset and being a part of everything else that you do in security. It doesn't take the place of pen testing. It doesn't take the place of a lot of other things you do. Instead, it's another tool in your toolbox, but a very, very crucial and essential part of your toolbox because it's going to find a lot of things that your pen tests and all those kinds of things won't find. The secure architecture design decisions that you made that are ultimately affecting the security of your system. And so then ultimately what you have is what I call this living threat model. It's something that continues to evolve. It's something that continues to um, grow with your system and change with your system. If you change your system, change your threat model because it does get impacted. Uh, one last thing I'll mention and then I'm gonna close today is this idea of a recursive threat modeling practice. There's a, an article by John Lambert, uh, he's at Microsoft, he mentioned this really interesting thing about the idea of, of your security controls creating vulnerability. I don't know if you've heard of this before, but uh, this is something that continues to come up, is that we like to think in lists. You know, us as security people, we think in lists. You know, we, okay, we did this, and we did this, and we did this, and we did this. But attackers don't think that way because they can't. They don't know your system, so they think in graphs. How does this connect to this, connect to this, connect to this, to figure out your system? Well, guess what? Your controls help the attacker know what's important to you. So now they know what to attack <laughs> because they know what's behind it probably is something important and more than likely you haven't thought what happens if that control fails. And so what this article points to, this idea of doing uh, you know, complete threat modeling not just the controls, but also what happens behind, behind the controls. Do you have a control in logging? Do you have you know, something, in, something else? It's sort of that defense in depth, but it's just really interesting, this, that the idea that controls come with risk, and you need to think about that, and think about that attackers don't just think in lists, they think about graphs, and how do I connect from this to this to this, but also what's important to your system so that I know as an attacker what could I then use to expose that and get closer and further into your system based on you giving me roadblocks or you know, giving me the map, if you will, of what's important. And so it's an interesting article. I you know, encourage you to go look at it and some of the ideas that he mentions in there. But this idea of recursive threat modeling, not just doing the first level, but then think what happens after, what happens next. How can we slow down the attacker? What else can we do? So, to finish, use threat modeling for secure design for new features about um, helping your testing. This can really help think about your system and ways to test for things. And then also understand the bigger picture. I found I have developers who don't understand the UI and the database or the middle tier. But they don't understand all of it. And when you get a bunch of people in a room and, and talk about this stuff and do a threat model, now they understand, oh, that's how that works with this. And that's why we do this. 
now I understand how it all works together and how it all you know, uh, plays together in terms of security, in terms of you know, comprehensively making sure we have a, a better secure system. Some resources, uh, some links, and then that's my information. Um, any questions today? Uh, maybe a minute. So you're talking about um, fuzzing or testing for uh, you getting recommendations on tools or ways to do uh, Specifically, in terms of those kinds of tools, I know there are some script tools that you can use that will change out data. So let's say, I mean, Python or whatever, you can write script tools that will do that. Um, I know there's some other, like for, for websites, for proxy tools that can do that, can send a lot of data. Uh, but for files, I would say script tools, that probably your best bet is open the file, insert something in that location, close it, run it again, and just continue to do that repeatedly with a, with a list. It's probably the best bet on that one. Good question. Any other questions? I know a mic's running around. Yes. Is it going to be available? It is. It's actually right now available on the website, on the, on the uh, LASCON website. You should be able to go on my session, and it's right there available today. And plus on my website, if you look under presentations, if you want to look at some older, I've done this a few times, there's some other things that have different slides. You're welcome to look at those as well. Okay, thank you.